ya está. Since showing you this photo two weeks ago that my military aerospace source sent me a year ago in 2021 to show me the cream colored skin that my source says is beneath the gray nanotechnology bodysuits. I also showed this four fingered hand that might be a second gray being retrieved from a UFO crash on the Peru Brazil border. These are actually referred to as orange grays because their pale skin has an orange hue under certain light frequencies. Since my July 6th and 13th Earth Files YouTube broadcasts, I have been shown the same orange gray photos on a Brazilian website that is in Portuguese. The year of the website's creation was 2007 but I have never heard of it before the past few days and have never seen the orange gray photos until 2021, a year ago, when they were sent to me by my military aerospace source as a reality check on what actual orange gray type extraterrestrials look like. I never showed anyone those photos until July 6th, two weeks ago never knew anything about the Brazil website. I don't know any other UFO researcher who has ever brought it up or that the, said that they knew anything about these photos. Given this new controversy about the Brazilian website, I reached out to remote viewer D.B. Bolton, also known as Buddy, who you've seen work with me before and is a very talented remote viewer. This week, I asked him if he would remote view the orange-gray black-eyed head photo and the four-fingered orange-gray hand, specifically on the question, what does he see through remote viewing in this ET death? I went over the first photographs, which are clearly an extraterrestrial, and I felt that they were not only real, but I got a whole sense of the history. It's from the Brazil Peru border. And I felt that Brazilian artist was paid and try to claim that it was his to muddle the field. Oh my gosh! Personally, I think this is a, uh, a strengthening education about what all has happened around this what was just going to be the first photo of a, a orange gray hand and a head the head is still a, a question mark even in uh, earth file supports mind um, he's very uh, analytical and very critical and he did a side-by-side -side comparison in which it is very true that the eye pattern in the we'll call it the alleged real photo versus the 3d created head the eyes do not match, and you can do an examination and make a comparison, and you will see that. But that does not mean that there isn't a real extraterrestrial sort of orangish gray being or civilization or species that looks exactly like that photo. And as Buddy pointed out, that's counter intel. Hello. Welcome friends, I'm Linda Moulton Howdy Doody, and this is my pretty pussy. 
Isn't my pussy pretty? I have the prettiest pussy. Yes, I do. My pussy is awesome. Isn't my pussy awesome? Look at my pussy. Wait a minute. Hey, this pussy is dead. Mr. Producer, get me a new pussy. This is a dead pussy. Nobody likes dead pussy. Jeez. Let me fix that light over here. That's maybe better. Oh, it's the wire in the way. There we go. Somebody better get me a new pussy. This is a dead pussy, and nobody likes dead. Anyway, we have a very special show for you tonight. Tonight, I will be uh, discussing my new whistleblowing insiders who are telling me some uh, fantastic fairy tales. I, I mean stories about... Um, the uh, spaceships under the ice in Antarctica. Yeah, did you know? They're spaceships, friends. They're spaceships under the ice in Antarctica. Yes, there is. One second. Okay. Oh, I really need to get my hair done, but this pandemic has been terrible. Okay, friends. So, I've got some new insiders. His name is Spartan27. Um, and he emailed me all of the proof that the aliens are under Antarctica. Yeah. Can you believe it, friends? This thing has been called a hall of mirrors with a quicksand floor. UFOs and aliens, sure, it's mysterious, right? And strange. Oh, how strange it is, friends. So... Wow, um, today we're going to be covering some uh, fantastic stories from my new source, Spartan27, or was it 28? I forget, I, every time I need new fake stories, I just invent a new Spartan guy. Huh? Yeah, it's a great business, I sell fairy tales, and make sure you buy my new book, Bedtime Fake Fairy Tale Alien Stories by Linda Moulton Howe. Ha! It'll be available at Amazon and all booksellers so that I can make enough money uh, to buy some new pussies. Because my pussy is dead, okay? And I need a new pussy. Yeah. All right, friends. So, what can I say? Uh, I got this new intel uh, from my government insider, even though I didn't check that he ever worked for the government. Why would I do that? It might mess up a good story I could sell. So Spartan 27, or let's just call him Spartan 28. I can't remember. All right. It's Spartan 28 sent me this email. Quote, there are uh, spaceships under Antarctica trapped in the ice. But since the ice is melting, the aliens are slowly waking up. Unquote. Ooh, friends, the aliens are waking up, and maybe they'll be, uh, we'll be able to prove the existence of extraterrestrial biological entities. Wouldn't that be great? Now, friends, I gotta tell you, uh, another quote from Spartan 20, from Spartan Guy, okay, my fake source, quote, the aliens are slowly waking up, and the U.S. government is sending dispatch teams to intercept the waking aliens, end quote. Ooh, I have quotes. <laughs> yeah, I like quotes, right? Quotes are good. Okay, friends, so you got to admit that this is a great story, and we have proof, right? We have an insider whistleblower. Well, my friends, it's a great story. And the government, the, the government is covering it up. Now, a lot.
Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back. Uh, apparently, the arts parts almost 30-year-old hoax is still being grifted upon. And even though we covered this uh, separately, I think twice already, at least once, uh, especially around the time that TTSA and their members, such as Christopher Mellon, Lou Elizondo, the fake UFO program director, uh, Gary Nolan, the wackadoo Stanford scientist, and Tom DeLong and others started pushing these out of this world materials. But wouldn't you be surprised to learn that the United States government has wasted apparently almost a million dollars on a complete and totally fake story hoax that originated originally with Art Bell in the 1990s? However, even Art Bell had to admit that there was nothing to this story. For those unaware, uh, a mysterious anonymous source sent Art Bell a letter with some metal samples in it, claiming that his father was part of some sort of covert UFO and alien crash retrieval program and was able to pilfer those uh, metal samples from a crash that occurred in Roswell in 1947. Uh, but big red flags to the story. First of all, it's an anonymous source. Nobody, to my knowledge, ever vetted that source uh, or his claims that his father was even in the military. Nobody can prove that that material was originally recovered from any crash, let alone a crash in uh, the magic uh, zone of Roswell in the late 1940s. And we've discussed this in great detail before. If you want your hoax to work, attach it to already existing mythology. So this is one of those add-ons to the Roswell mythology. Uh, and as far as Linda Moulton Howe, we began tonight's broadcast just to show you how ridiculous this woman is. Uh, in the clip that we played at the top of the broadcast, she is claiming that uh, essentially the artist that really created those fake alien photos she was selling as real was being paid off by the men in black to muddy the waters because that those pictures really were from an alien. We covered this extensively. Those pictures that she promoted as real pictures of aliens were 100% completely and totally fake, created by a Portuguese CGI artist who we even tracked down and did an interview with. We had to translate it and everything because he barely spoke English. But we did that work just to prove to you what a garbage peddling scumbag this woman is for deceptively selling completely and totally fake pictures of aliens from a, a website. By the way, those pictures were created for a fictional blog web series about the men in black in South America. That's where those pictures actually came from. She claimed they were real pictures of aliens, and she got the pictures from her secret government insider source. Uh, and then when we caught her, instead of admitting that she made a mistake or whatever, what does she do? She calls in a remote viewer. That's right. She called in a guy with fake superpowers to remote view the fake pictures of aliens. It doesn't get more ridiculous than this but this is the world that we're in and this is where we find ourselves and by the way this is the second time that we have caught her selling completely and totally fake pictures of aliens uh the first time she sold pictures from a 2005 video game cover claiming they were pictures from again from her military insider sources of a real gray alien uh taken on the moon no that was from an area 51 video game uh, pr first produced in 2005. And the reason that I was able to catch her with that one is because I owned and played that video game a lot. It was a great shoot 'em up. You ran through Area 51 shooting aliens. Uh, it was kind of like, you know, Quake, but alien, alien in Area 51 themed. So back to Linda Moulton Hale. Uh, and let's uh, let me preface my statements tonight by saying that Linda Moulton Hale is just one of the many people who pushed and profited from this completely and totally fake story uh, that has been called Art's Parts for quite some time now. So after Art Bell decided there was no validity to the claims, uh, perhaps he saw an early scientific analysis of those materials, which we're going to share with you tonight. And nobody gives you the original analysis 
which says these are no, there's nothing extraordinary about these uh, materials. They're normal earthly materials. Uh, but they buried that uh, and then they fired that scientist because he wasn't going to go along with the alien spaceship parts grift that they were doing. So Art Bell, to his credit, uh, you know, stepped away from the story and said, I, I don't see any evidence or proof either that the person who sent these was legitimate and real or that his father who claimed got the materials were real or that the materials are anything extraordinary other than bits and blobs of metals. So enter Linda Moulton Hale, who decided to pick up the hoax and run with the hoax after it had already played a significant part on the Art Bell show. So, but we have to take a moment, remember that all this hoaxing goes back to the 1990s, but here we are again, and it is being, you know, bandied about again as something real or, you know, something that it's not. And uh, this is one of those things that I don't think the true believers will ever let go of. But recently, the Pentagon in their Aero historical report shot to shit this completely and totally fake story and this hoax of alien crash retrieval metals. It wasn't alien, normal earthly metals, just like the first scientist that Linda Moulton Hale hired to do an analysis said. But Linda Bolt Hell buried that analysis and kept right on grifting on this completely and totally fake story for years. Uh, and so I just want to be uh, clear in that one of the reasons we're doing this broadcast is because Linda Bolt Hell is now calling the government uh, liars and Sean Kirkpatrick as well a liar because she still claims that she was in possession of these alien spaceship parts. But uh, we can see the response from Arrow. And by the way, after Linda Moulton Hale grifted off of these fake alien spaceship parts, she sold them to Tom DeLonge for, I think it was $35,000. And then Tom DeLonge entered into a contract with the United States Army, whereby the United States Army, our United States Army, wasted, uh, I think it was three quarters of a million dollars to study these exotic materials that were not exotic. Later, Aero would get a hold of the materials from the United States Army and perform their own analysis. And in the Aero historical report that's got Linda Moulton Howe and the other grifters who sold this fake story so upset, uh, they blew it out of the water. Normal earthly metals, nothing exotic, nothing extraordinary. And isn't it interesting that TTSA was soliciting public investment money while they were pushing completely and totally false statements about these so-called alien crash retrieval materials. But here's what Arrow had to say. Experimentation on alleged extraterrestrial spacecraft sample. Arrow has concluded that a sample from an alleged crashed off-world spacecraft that Arrow acquired from a private UAP investigating organization, that would be TTSA, and the U.S. Army is a manufactured terrestrial alloy and does not represent off-world technology or possess any exceptional qualities. The sample is primarily composed of magnesium, zinc, and bismuth with some other trace elements such as lead. This assessment was based on its materials characterization. So interesting that Aero blew both Linda Moulton Howe and the TTSA claims out of the water. And we're going to go through all those claims and remind everybody what scumbag lying grifters these people selling this completely and totally fake story were. And we're going to remind everyone of some of the other claims that the, the people making these claims have made. It's amazing to me that the same group of grifters is involved in so much of this alien UFO mythology. So uh, this is what Arrow had to say, of course, and Linda Moulton Howe didn't like that. So she made a video to call the government a liar. And by the way, every time she gets caught, we've, we've caught her ourselves here three or four times selling a completely and totally fake story. Every time she gets caught, she pulls out the men in black excuse. She pulls out the men in black excuse and claims that it's a government cover up. Very convenient that anytime you get caught, uh, especially if you get caught selling a completely and totally fake story, you could just claim there's a cover up and cover your ass for defrauding the public. And by the way, I'm going out on a limb here. 
I always say this, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a, uh, a law enforcement officer and I don't work at the Securities and Exchange Commission. But somebody's got to explain to me how Linda Malton Howe can take all this money from public speaking fees, from books, from documentaries and other income sources to claim that she's in possession of alien crash retrieval materials and then scientific analysis on those materials is performed and we find out it, it's nothing alien, it's nothing extraordinary. To me, that's a form of consumer fraud. And uh, we can extend that thought process uh, and say that if you have a public investment company and you're soliciting public investments while you're uh, claiming that you're in possession of exotic materials from UFO crash retrievals, and then you're taking money from the public, that could be considered lying to investors and extremely problematic for the people who did that. Uh, and by the way, um, I'm looking for my phone. Do I have it? Oh, yeah, I do have it. Uh, I spent I spent the greater part of last week and a good part of this week so far on the phone trying to get some answers from government people. And by the way, I'll have an announcement to make shortly. I'll be doing some writing pieces, some written pieces for, uh, you know, a print uh, media organization. So I actually have real press credentials in pursuing some of the stories that we're doing here now. Even with those, I got nobody. I did get somebody on the phone from the United States Army uh, Office of Public Relations because they entered into a $750,000 contract, I think it was, to study these exotic materials that weren't exotic, and now the government has admitted they weren't exotic in the form of the Aero Historical Report. So I want to ask the Army, why did they waste three quarters of a million dollars on spooky stories from people that have provably been caught selling fake alien stories before? Um, and uh, I did speak with someone, somebody's supposed to get back to me, so we might have an update. As of the time of this broadcast, no one has uh, given me an on-the-record comment we can use during our broadcasts here. Um, but I wanted to get into the history, some of the history of Linda Moulton Howe, who, again, uh, sold this story all through the 90s and continues to profit from it. She just made a new video about this same story. And remember, this is, you know, back to 1996, she grifted this. Now she's grifting it again claiming that there's a government cover-up about these alien crash retrieval materials. I don't buy it based on her history. Remember, Linda Moulton Hale is also the woman who claimed that uh, aliens are coming from, you know, vast other star systems, and they're coming here to Earth to cut off the assholes and lips of cows. She's also claimed um, that there are secret bases and spaceships uh, under the ice in Antarctica, and her source for that were completely and totally fake military insiders and, and a fake Navy SEAL. We proved that here previously. She uses completely and totally fake stories. This is the woman who claimed that aliens were responsible for crop circles, including a crop circle that she covered that the, the hoaxers of which went to her with pictures and video and showed her how they created the fake crop circles. She still doubled down and said, oh, alien cover up. The government's covering it up. They paid those people to say that they created this alien crop circle. So Linda Moulton Howe has made mac wacky claims for decades now. She's never proven anything. She's made herself a very rich woman, though. Congratulations, uh, you know, for being very successful at selling lies. But lies are still lies. And uh, I don't know how legally Linda Moulton Howe is able to continue her business model. Um, she has provably defrauded the public with 100% completely and totally provably fake stories that she claims are true stories for money. Great. So uh, tonight I'll be offering, among other things, a critical analysis of Linda Moulton Howe and the pseudoscience behind her alleged UFO material claims. Linda Moulton Howe is a prominent figure in the realm of ufology and paranormal investigations and has garnered a great deal of attention for her purported revelations about extraterrestrial phenomena. However, even the least little bit of scrutiny reveals an extreme pattern of pseudoscientific claims and sensationalism, particularly in her allegations and uh, assertions regarding alleged UFO materials. One such instance, of course, is the story of tonight's broadcast, uh, the Arts Parts story. 
where Linda Moulton Howe claimed to possess pieces of an alien spacecraft. However, a critical examination of her work reveals a troubling trend of exploiting scientific language and pseudoscience for her own financial gain, rather than advancing genuine inquiry. The arts part saga unfolded with Howe asserting, uh, gaining possession of anomalous materials that were sent to Art Bell from a completely anonymous source, which to this day still hasn't been named or identified. And uh, these materials were purportedly from a UFO crash site. Through her platforms, including books, lectures, podcasts, appearances, documentaries, live events, and more, Linda Moulton Howe spun a narrative of otherworldly origin for these materials, captivating audiences with tales of extraterrestrial technology. However, a closer inspection reveals a narrative fraught with inconsistencies and lacking any empirical evidence or valid scientific proof of her fantastical claims. Central to Hal's narrative is the manipulation of scientific te terminology to lend credibility to her claims. She em employs uh, scientific jargon such as isotopic ratios and nano-layered structures to create an illusion of scientific rigor or investigation. Yet upon scrutiny by real or genuine materials experts, these claims of hers crumble under the weight of the least little bit of skepticism. Genuine scientific inquiry demands rigorous peer review and an adherence to good scientific principles, none of which are evident in any of Linda Moulton Howe's presentations. Moreover, Howe's sensationalism and willingness to embrace fringe theories undermine the integrity of her work. Rather than subjecting her claims to rigorous scientific scrutiny or peer review, she often re relies solely on anecdotal evidence, anonymous sources, and cherry-picked testimonials to bolster her completely and totally fake stories. This approach not only hampers real or genuine scientific inquiry into uh, claims like this, but also it fosters a culture of pseudoscience where critical thinking takes a back seat to sensationalism and clickbait copy and paste journalism. Now, critics argue that uh, Linda Moulton Howe's motivations lie more in financial gain and self-promotion than in the genuine pursuit of real knowledge. Her books, lectures, and media appearances generate revenue by exploiting public fascination with these topics. Uh, by peddling sensationalized stories of extraterrestrial encounters and alleged UFO materials, how perpetuates a cycle of misinformation, disinformation, and fake stories that enriches herself at the expense of the public and at the expense of scientific integrity. Hal's lack of transparency regarding the origins the chain of custody and the handling of the, this alleged UFO material raises questions about the authenticity of her claims. After all, there is no chain of custody. Certainly without verifiable evidence or independent verification by uh, a real and recognized material science expert, her assertions remain firmly entrenched in the realm of speculation and conjecture. Genuine scientific investigation demands transparency, peer review, and accountability, none of which are apparent in Howe's modus operandi. Linda Moulton Howe's work, particularly regarding alleged UFO materials, epitomizes the pitfalls of pseudoscience, clickbait, and sensationalism. Through a combination of scientific jargon, anecdotal evidence, anonymous sources, and financial opportunism, Hal perpetrates a narrative that undermines genuine scientific inquiry. Rather than advancing our understanding of the cosmos, her sensationalized claims serve to enrich herself at the expense of critical thinking and empirical evidence. Her contributions to ufology should be viewed with skepticism and due to her being caught selling numerous fake stories in her past, they should also be subjected to rigorous scrutiny before being accepted as credible. One second.
Thank God for the cough button sometimes. So we're going to delve into this a little bit deeper. And interestingly, there is an ancient article on the first uh, selling of this completely and totally fake story. Um, and that's why I'm thankful for uh, other researchers like UFO Watchdog from UFOWatchdog.com. This is an article that is interesting. It tells the whole story of Linda Moulton Howe's selling of this completely and totally fake hoax. Uh, and by the way, all the sources that I'm sharing this evening are in the description of the video or podcast. So if you want to uh, read them in full or use them yourself uh, for content creation purposes, we provide those. Is alleged UFO crash site all it's cracked up to be? Report compiled by scientific research technologist indicates earthly origin. Hal says material is still an anomaly. Um, so show me one second. Let me uh, let me just make this a little bit bigger. Pardon me, but uh, I'm a little bit uh, visually impaired. Show me the evidence. Investigative UFO science and bismuth magnesium layering of artifact from White Sands, New Mexico in 1947. And by the way, there's various tellings of this story. In some of them, this material came from White Sands, New Mexico. In others, it came from Roswell in 1947. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, confusion. They don't they can't even get the story straight about where the material actually came from. It depends on who you ask. Show me the evidence. Find out what it's like to investigate hard evidence. This is from uh, Linda Mont Howe promoting a lecture. Uh, investigative hard evidence when your own government says there is nothing there. Universities are scared to use their resources. Foundations will not provide funding and peer review science is closed off. The amazing tale of a unique layered allegedly uh, a, a unique layered metal allegedly removed from a wedge-shaped aerial vehicle from unknown origin at White Sands, New Mexico in 1947. I have basically exhausted every every resource that I have. Uh, ever tried to use from about 1940 to now. Linda says, I have found no reference even in government research for bismuth magnesium layers. She's completely and totally wrong here. There are things uh, that are made with magnesium and bismuth layers. She just didn't do any actual research before putting her mouth in gear. Again, this is to sell a lecture series. This material didn't just make itself. It had to come from somewhere. And nobody's told anyone about this material. And here we have it. Travis Taylor, physicist working for the Defense Intelligence Agency, Redstone Army Arsenal, Huntsville, Alabama. In her presentation, Linda will have a physical sample of the unidentified layered metal for the workshop audience to see and touch, plus a video of her audio excerpt from her nine-year effort to find a source in government, military, or civilian sector Anywhere in the world with knowledge about layering one to four microns of pure bismuth. And of course, you could buy the VHS video for just $24.95. So Linda Moulton Howe was all in on selling this hoax. Uh, and here's where it gets good. After seeing the above, UFO Watchdog just wants to remind folks of a little known scientific report compiled at the request of Linda Howe. In the report seen below, scientific technologist Nicholas A. Ryder examined the alleged UFO crash debris. He also successfully replicated the metal and presented Hal with the sample. UFO Watchdog was told by Ryder that Hal reportedly scoffed at the results of the report because the replicated material was not 100% exactly like the alleged UFO crash debris Hal has been advertising as being mysterious. Ryder stated in a letter to UFO Watchdog, Linda's opinion was that what I had offered had no resemblance to her sample, but she never did make any detailed and accurate reference to it either. Uh, Ryder also mentioned, and this is true, uh, it's in her lecture, how was reporting that the mysterious metal would move when high voltage was applied to it. Ryder stated that a piece of a soda can or just about any metal for that matter would move with enough voltage running through it. So these are some of the pseudoscientific claims. Oh, if you put voltage through it, it moves. Well, I've played with enough Tesla coils and Van de Graaff generators to tell you that if you apply enough voltage to any piece of metal, it's going to move. 
these are the pseudoscience claims. UFO Watchdog goes on to state, odd that Hal would report everything showing the piece to be unusual, yet not report on the conclusions of the report found below. On a side note, the scientific technologist that compiled this report at the request of Hal is the same scientific technologist Hal used to examine the bogus Brazil UFO abduction. Hal wasn't apparently satisfied with those results and chose to use someone else to examine the materials after Ryder and another scientist concluded there was nothing unusual about the evidence. So here we have a cherry picking. She gets uh, a scientist to analyze the metal. He says, these are nothing spectacular. She goes and gets somebody else to keep analyzing until she finds something mysterious that she can sell. Summary of our analysis of the claimed Roswell crash artifact. See, here we go. Earlier, it was from White Sands. Here, it's from Roswell. Um, and this is from the scientist uh, that conducted the material samples. The metal sample was eventually returned to Linda Howe, though we retain a very tiny fragment to this day with her permission. While our analysis of the sample by SEM and EDS spectropathy agreed that the performed uh, with that performed at the other labs, our opinion of the origin of the sample did not represent the final verdict that appeared to win out on Art Bell show or later in literary references. We were and remain skeptical for reasons that will become apparent following the text of our report and a short update. So he says, I received by FedEx in 1996. Remember, this hoax goes so far back. He received a small metal uh, artifact from Linda Moulton Howe. The purported origin of this piece, as well as highlights of previous analytical work, had been revealed to me by Linda Moulton Howe in earlier telephone conversations. So he talks about the physical characteristics. It appears to be a small chunk of lightweight metal sawed or microtoned from a larger parent piece. It is irregular in contour and measured 22 millimeters by four millimeters by six millimeters. Of the two non-cut side, one is a silvery color textured with many small convex bumps and the other is gold black color with a fluted surface, a concave negative. Initial visual inspection, along with the inspection of the photos of the parent autograph, shows a clear uh, communar structure along with discrete bands or layers. The artifact overall appears to be quite brittle. An end uh, of the thin delaminated portion was easily snapped off with finger pressure. So if this thing's so brittle that you can break it with your fingers, what does it do? With, how is it the parts of an alien spaceship? I would think that an alien spaceship has to be a little more, uh, you know, I don't know, structurally sound than that. But, hey, uh, you could do a lot of mental gymnastics to explain that away, I suppose. He goes on to describe the equipment that was used to examine portions of the smaller artifact fragment. Photos taken showed features quite similar to those seen previously during recent analysis carried out by another Midwestern location. The layering effect is quite noticeable. Crystal structure of the light gray metal composing the thicker layers is indeterminate visually. Uh, okay, so they use an X-ray analyzer to examine compositions, both silvery and blackish reasons. The silvery region, region is shown to be pure magnesium with a small signal for zinc, perhaps indicating about two to three percent of the latter. So it's magnesium and it's and it's zinc. That's it. Nuclear properties, the larger artifact portion was tested with a Geiger counter. No indications of radioactivity were noted. Uh, questions were raised by Linda Moulton Howe as to whether the materials of the artifact were of common, predominant, or stable isotope. The only testing possible at this location for this purpose was a simple uh, volume versus weight test. The volume of the large artifact portion was determined by displacement of water in a pipette... So uh, it's, it's comparable. It's normal earthly uh, isotopic ratios. Uh, one second here. So, you know, the scientists determined it's normal earthly, it's normal earthly metals. There's no indication. There's all these claims uh, that people make that, oh, the isotopic ratios prove it's from another star system. That's never been proven with these, never. Electrical properties, the artifact appears to be quite conductive and in any orientation has a resistance too low to measure with the typical ohm meter. Uh, 
Well, let's get to the conclusions. At the most basic of levels, we would freely state that the artifact portion provided by Linda Moulton Hale does not seem to be composed of elements or compounds, which are... One second. Thanks, guys. I've spent... Oh, okay. So does not seem to be uh, composed of elements or compounds which are unknown nor is it composed of alloys that appear to be of purity or combination beyond the scope of current material science. Those were other claims. The, the claims from Linda Moulton Hale were that the bismuth and the magnesium in these samples were too pure uh, compared to our current material science processing. That was completely and totally a false statement. This family of filming processes includes sputtering beam, uh, res resistivity, heated thermal evaporation, all common vacuum pro uh, processes used widely by industry. The structure of the artifact very strongly suggests long-term high rate disordered uh, growth on a cold surface, chilled evaporate shield chamber walls. I've spent nearly 12 years working in the thin film and vacuum process field. So he goes on to say what he believes that this these items are. The composition of the magnesium zinc alloy comes close to several commercial magnesium alloys. All of these alloys, however, are said to have a very small quantity of zinc, typically 0.5 to 0.7. I have been informed that zinc was not seen in earlier EDS scans at the locations, nor does it seem to be evident in my analysis of the artifact. However, I do know that at least in our machine, resolution below 1% is usually not possible. So... It is also evident that the artifact does not, at least in its current state of condition, seem to produce any voltages or current, nor that does it act as a superconductor, at least at room temperature or at 77K. There were also claims that this was a, this was some kind of superconductor, or as Tom DeLong said on the Joe Rogan show, you could shoot it with terahertz and it would float. None of the wackadoo's claims about these materials have ever been proven. The remaining unusual aspect of the artifact is simply the combination of magnesium and bismuth in a single structure. Uh, magnesium, of course, finds most use in the automotive and aerospace industry as a lighter weight substitute for aluminum. It may also be used to make some optical grade films and plating. So he goes on to say, to date, I have not been I have been unable to find any references to uses of magnesium and bismuth together in one process or product. Linda Moulton Howe has claimed that officials at Dow, one of the largest manufacturers of the world, are unaware of any use of bismuth in the, their manufacturing process. Uh, of course, this is not to say that some very specialized use of magnesium in a bismuth application or vice versa. We have simply not found it yet in our detective work. My own opinion is that the artifact probably represents a curious piece of industrial byproduct from the thin films industry or a magnesium casting, uh, casting plant. However, until a matchup is found, I will not rule out the possibility of a more unusual origin. And then there's notes as of November 2001. In the year or so that followed the analysis by the sample, the, myth the mythos and mystery of the bismuth magnesium artifact continue to grow. It became the source for a wide range of speculations, some valid, some baseless, some the anti-gravity and UFO research subcultures. The extraterrestrial origin of the artifact appeared to be firmly entrenched in the minds of most who listened, read, and believed. Presumably, there aren't many old films about vacuum technology folks out there. Claims were made by Tesla coil enthusiast in Alabama that a portion of the artifact in his possession acted strangely and tried to levitate in the presence of electrostatic field of a Van de Graaff generator and radio frequency source. We did perform a separate replication here and found that our metal fragment danced about as well in the field of a Van de Graaff, Van de Graaff generator. And so did a piece of aluminum foil. Please understand that just about any small unattached mass will dance in the field of 200,000 volt source. The mythos grew. In 2000, one last revelation came our way on the origin of the artifact. The combination of bismuth and magnesium had eluded us for four years, but then one day we found a reference to an obscure industrial process used in the refinement of lead. Of lead. The process called the Betterson Kroll process uses molten magnesium floated over the surface of liquid lead. The magnesium sucks up 
and pulls bismuth impurities out of the lead. Often the magnesium is used over and over again. Could this little known process have been the real origin of some unusual looking metal residue that was then in turn promoted as a piece of alien technology? So the original scientist that Linda Moulton Howe hires basically says these are normal earthly metals. There's nothing extraordinary about it. And a lot of the claims that you're making don't pan out in the world of science. Instead, uh, you know, and he also replicated the material. So there have been claims from both Linda Moulton Howe and to the Stars Academy and this Adam project. Oh, they, uh, it, it's a mass cancellation. Like if you shoot a certain electron, if you shoot electron at it, you can see that it cancels mass, meaning it cancels out the weight of an object. No, all of these claims that have been made by the all these UFO grifters for decades now were completely and totally destroyed by the original science, scientists that looked at it that we've just uh, shared the report with you. And also now by Arrow, who looked at these materials and said, no, these are normal earthly materials. There's, there's nothing ex extraterrestrial or out of this world. And they don't have the unusual properties that the uh, UFO promoters profiting from this story have claimed. But, you know, and, and listen, really... I thought a good deal about this. Like, I, I really don't care if you're going to tell people fake stories, but when you start wasting taxpayer money on your on fake stories and forcing the government to waste taxpayer money, uh, then I have a problem with it because that's not you know that that's everybody's money. And why should the United States government waste any money in dealing with the claims made by UFO wackadoos? And by the way, every single person that has been involved in this uh, situation has really uh, a, a sordid history of making completely and totally false claims. Um, and I'm sure that some of you may be familiar uh, with some of the reporting of Stephen Greenstreet. And, you know, after, uh, it's important to note that after Linda Moulton Hale got done grifting off of this uh, fake story for decades. Then she sells the material uh, to to the Stars Academy, and you know Tom DeLong, the the failed rock star, and uh, let's see, Lou Elizondo, the fake UFO program director. So everybody involved in this story is extremely problematic if you look at this from an ethical perspective. Also involved with TTSA was Hal Putoff and Eric Davis. I'm going to share something with you from Stephen Greenstreet. Um, UFO whistleblower is connected to claims of killer poltergeist werewolves and an infamous haunted ranch. David Grush is a former military who claims the government is in possession of alien UFOs and alien bodies. Uh, yeah. And then here's the part about Eric Davis. Eric Davis is an astrophysicist and longtime government contractor. Weeks ago on Facebook, Davis claimed to be his special security officer in Colorado Springs, uh, was about to be a UFO whistleblower in a Washington Post article. Why he doesn't name Grush here, we now know Grush is a UFO whistleblower from Colorado Springs. So Eric Davis was involved in this fake Arts Park story in the form of the Adam Project, right? And here's some stuff about Eric Davis. So once it gets out of the hands of wackadoo Linda Moulton Hale, it goes into other hands of wackadoos, such as Eric Davis, who was in the original Adam Project videos where TTSA claimed they'd be releasing all this scientific data on these UAP crash materials that were now in their possession after they bought them from Linda Moulton Hale for some $35,000. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. Okay. In 2000, uh, during his time at Skimwalker, Eric Davis was supposedly frozen in a trance and heard voices in his head that said, we're watching you. In 2003, Eric Davis famously wrote a crackpot paper for the Air Force Research Laboratory about teleportation and psychic powers. Included in the paper was his favorite review of Bending Spoons with Your Mind. Uh, total, and the Air Force called Eric Davis's research crackpot research. That's why he's got crackpot in quotes. From 2008 to 2010, Davis was part of yet another Bigelow Skimwalker ghost hunt. 
but this time with a government contract, a program called OSAP. So Eric Davis was involved with wasting $22 million studying dino beavers, uh, werewolves, smoking dogs, poltergeists, and UFOs for the United States government. Bigelow's longtime senator, a friend, Senator Harry Reid, acquired $22 million in taxpayer money to investigate, among other things, the paranormal Disneyland of Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, in, in 2017, a front page New York Times article revealed this OSAP program to the world, except the article never mentions OSAP and said it was only a military UFO program. No ghosts or goblins were mentioned. Turns out this entire article was false. And who wrote that article? Leslie Keene and Ralph Blumenthal. Uh, but back to Eric Davis, he goes on to say about Davis, in 2020, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal, who wrote the abysmally fake 2017 New York Times article about fake Pentagon UFO program, Lou Elizondo, uh, they released another New York Times article revealing Eric Davis had classified briefings with congressional leaders about, quote, off-world vehicles not made on this earth, unquote, that had crashed and were retrieved by shadowy programs. So uh, the point of Mr. Greenstreet's post here is to say that all of David Grush's claims were being fed to him by Eric Davis, who's also involved in this TTSA uh, what has been described as a techno investment scam in which millions of dollars were collected from investors while they were promising they had exotic UAP crash materials in their possession and that on their board was a former UFO program director for 10 years that fun ran a funded $22 million program. All those were lies. They lied to investors. They also promised investors they were going to develop a revolutionary a spaceship with a revolutionary power source that would change the world. All that was lies. They collected millions of dollars and all the investors got was a shitty movie made by Tom DeLonge that failed miserably, a complete and total failure. Um, and then, of course, Christopher Mellon and Lou Elizondo left TTSA. I guess they didn't get enough book deals and TV show deals and they wanted, you know, they wanted more UFO dollars. So they leave. Um, and it, it's just it's amazing to me. And of course, how put off was involved in the TTSA part of the Arts Park scam and how put off was the one who fed all the information to Tom DeLonge. And Tom DeLong famously went on Joe Rogan and made all sorts of wacky pseudoscience claims about uh, uh, about these materials. But the problem is that he, he's not a scientist. He couldn't explain it or it's completely and totally fake and pseudoscience. So how put off is making these claims, how put off and Eric Davis, and by the way, I am speculating, but they were involved in this TTSA Adam project. They made all these claims that these materials had all these exotic properties and they couldn't be produced on earth. They need to be produced in, in a zero gravity environment. All of that was false, but we need to understand that how put off and Eric Davis make false statements and claims with zero evidence all the time. After all, Eric Davis was just quoted in a New York times article a few years ago, claiming that the government is in possession of alien spacecraft which is essentially the, the same thing that Grush is saying. People told him that. Who told him? Eric Davis probably told him that, right? Uh, and so there is a blog post uh, on Medium that uh, is titled, Tom DeLong is a Scam Artist. And uh, it is really ridiculous, right? Uh, and I'm, we're going to get into that because it details the claims made by Tom DeLong about these arts parts materials. Uh, late last year, and again, all this is in the description of the video. Late last year, DeLong appeared on Joe Rogan's podcast to discuss his company, To the Stars, and the evidence for alien life. It's painful to say the least. What it ultimately does is show why evidence is important. It also demonstrates why, if you're going to be the face of a science-based organization, it's important to know the lingo. Uh, here are some important quotes from that interview. When asked about really anything, I don't want to get into that. I haven't seen anything physically, says Tom DeLong. When asked about the people who communicated with him, I can't say who they were. I can't tell you who it's from. I don't know what the spectrum of infrared, the satellites he's incredibly vague about. <laughs> Rogan looks increasingly more frustrated and 
uh, distrusting of DeLong as the interview continues. At one point, DeLong is discussing how they are able to put a gravitational bubble around an object and how it changes the space-time continuum around it. He claims that they're able to demonstrate this by shooting a single electron over the object. Rogan asks an obvious question. How do you shoot a single electron? And Tom DeLong replies, fuck if I know, I'm not a physicist. How would they do that? And DeLong says they're doing crazier shit than that at CERN. So it's important to realize that who's on Tom DeLong's staff at TTSA? Apparently, Hal put off and Eric Davis. They're in the videos about these arts parts. You can look it up. It's called The Atom Project. So is Lou Elizondo, the fake UFO program director. So do we have enough wackadoos yet involved in this story? To recap, DeLong's stunning lack of knowledge around something uh, he is purporting to be objective fact and represents as something his organization is active in demonstrating and proving is factual. DeLong isn't a physicist. He doesn't know how to explain something. He is hoping people take it as word. And then, it, and then he says other people are doing harder stuff, so it's not unreasonable that this could be true, according to him. Rogan points out the enormous size of CERN, but DeLong deflects and changes the subject. DeLong also throws out other terms without knowing what they mean. He mentions artificial gravity bubbles. While artificial gravity is possible, having it in a bubble is nothing short of science fiction. If he'd like us to believe this is possible, he needs to bring a physicist on board who can evaluate his claim. <laughs> so it gets worse because it just this whole article just destroys all of the TTSA claims. Like this one, the next big claim is that the material was atomically aligned and had 80 layers within a few microns. I'm not sure how DeLong was able to discover something that was atomically aligned without a team of chemists on board. And for a second claim, he mentions layers of what? A few microns, which is an incredibly minute measurement. One micron is 10 to the six meters, but knowing that these layers are pretty important. The closest he comes is mentioning metals of purity not in our solar system made in an area where there's no gravity. To start, it must have been pretty difficult for those metals to have been made with no gravity, as there's fucking gravity everywhere. This is where this these pseudoscience claims fall apart. When astronauts in outer space, they are not experiencing zero gravity. They are in free fall around the Earth or the sun, and there was zero gravity outside of Earth's atmosphere, the moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and every planet other than ours, would be missing. Gravity isn't necessarily the strongest force, but it's one of the farthest reaching. So DeLong gets it completely and totally wrong. And the article here goes on to state, as for metal purity, DeLong, what is DeLong talking about? It's pure nonsense. It was something concocted by a research group with a deep-seated confirmation bias that alien life forms have been visiting our planet. In fact, there was nothing to confirm much of what they reported, save for the fact that they found some alloys something a grad student could easily analyze and find conclusive information on, including where in the universe it had likely come from. Anyone heard of terahertz? DeLong mentions terahertz radiation against the alloy he claims they found, being able to lower the object's mass and make it levitate. Sadly, he would not be able to demonstrate this because they lack the power to do so. It sounds like a nifty theoretical physics prediction, except it's bullshit. Scientists have actually discovered as early as 2009 that terahertz radiation can be produced simply by peeling tape. Beyond all this, DeLong talks about his interactions with people involved, like the kid you want uh, in middle school who claims to have a girlfriend at another school in Canada. <laughs> you remember that guy? He references meetings with general, multi-star generals and admirals. Like those titles without military uh, division they're from, names or how they're involved in such going on means anything. DeLong hides everything that might lend credence to his claims with calls to secrecy, except if he's already talked about it in one of his books, interviews, or other projects that require you to pay. In fact, it almost com becomes transparent that this is all a ploy to sell more of his science fiction work now that Blink-182 has given him the boot. No names, no scientifically verifiable or physically possible, concepts and everything he either doesn't want to talk about or claims he can't. DeLong is a walking example of why a bibliography is necessary. Stay in school, kids, and don't do drugs. And this was written by uh, Matthew O'Neill. Again, the title of this is 
uh, Tom DeLonge is a scam artist, and I can't say that I disagree. So uh, on to the next part of the story, and that is that this story gets stranger. And after all of these, remember now, we have Linda Moulton Hale who collected perhaps tens of thousands of dollars from this completely and totally provably fake story. She sold lectures. She did monetized YouTube videos, monetized podcasts about it. She also sold a VHS tape of her lecture on these fake spaceship materials for $24.95 plus shipping and handling. It's a great tape. You can't get it from me. Uh, but actually, I do have a copy, and maybe we'll go over it one night here, just to laugh at the ridiculousness of this uh, lunatic running around telling people, I got spaceship parts! I got spaceship parts! The scientists said they're not spaceship parts, but I'm going to just lie and say they are. Then she sells the materials to TTSA for $35,000 reportedly. And then they start making monetized content. They start soliciting investors. Look, man, we got this UFO crash retrieval material, and we're going to scientifically analyze it with our wackadoo scientist, Eric Davis, uh, you know, who believes that spoon bending is real and poltergeists followed him home from Skinwalker Ranch and our other science guy, Hal Putoff, who was once fooled into believing that Yuri Geller had superpowers uh, while he was using children's magic tricks. Very reputable science guys. But they still somehow produced enough publicity from this stuff that they were able to collect millions of dollars from investors who they told they were going to study these materials and release all the scientific data. Uh, they never released shit. They never released any data. None. They told a lot of stories, many of them, including Gary Nolan, um, the creator of the Soul Foundation. You remember him. He was part of the completely and totally fake story Ross Coulthard sold, where they promised everybody they had, quote, conclusive proof of alien technology, all confirmed by this renowned scientist. And then they cut to a shot of Michio Kaku, it was all bullshit. They had no evidence. So, of course, Nolan is in there. And by the way, that's another problem. You know, Eric Davis is a physicist, and, and Hal Putoff is an electrical engineer, and Gary Nolan is an immunologist. None of those people are qualified to analyze material samples and get to the bottom of this mystery. But since they were on board with the TTSA, uh, what, what has been called a techno scam, that's who these people were relying on. Them and people like Travis Taylor. You remember him, the Skinwalker Ranch ghost hunter who can't tell the difference between a fly flying by a camera and an alien spacecraft doing 30,000 miles an hour? He's supposed to be an optical physicist. He's also not qualified to do materials analysis. You need a material scientist or a chemist to do these analyses properly. But that's not what we get. We just get, well, here's our science guy. He is a scientist. He's also a fucking wackadoo, but forget about the wackadoo part. He's going to tell you about the aliens. It's so stupid. So I'm going to share this next article, uh, which is about, uh, he did find, uh, this is about them finding some, uh, finding these materials. And uh, I'm going to share my screen. And by the way, we're citing fair use for all that we share here. This is from Popular Mechanics. Quote, they've been collected. This is about these alien crash retrieval materials. They've been collected from sources with varying levels of chain of custody documentation. So we are focusing on verifiable facts and working to develop independent scientific proof of these materials. Uh, varying levels of chain of custody documentation. The arts parts were sent by an anonymous sender who made all kinds of claims there is no chain of custody on the arts parts. And that's the bismuth and magnesium that we've been hearing about. Unless TTSA can show that they have other parts that do have chain of custody. This is a bluff. In some cases, the manufacturing technology required to fabricate the material is only now becoming available. But the material has, was, has been in documented possession since the mid-1990s. Again, this is arts parts. We currently have multiple material samples being analyzed by contracted laboratories and have plans to expand the scope of this study. They never released any results. 
The press doesn't really say much about the mysterious nature of the uh, metals. Motherboard questions whether or not they could be metal alloys and other materials recovered from unidentified aerial phenomenon that the Pentagon's secret UFO program once housed in Las Vegas buildings, as the New York Times reported in 2017. However, the metals are or aren't, uh, will keep a close eye on what DeLong finds next. Either way, it's bound to be more interesting than another Angels and Airwaves album. Ooh, a bust on DeLong about his shitty band after uh, Blink-182. If you think Blink-182 sucks, you should hear his next band, Angels and Airwaves. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's them uh, announcing, making various claims about these materials. And remember that many of the members of the TTSA gang were promoting these so-called crash retrieval materials as something extraordinary. And there's also the misuse of the word meta materials, which drives me crazy. Uh, meta is from the Greek meaning essentially more than. Uh, so more than ordinary materials, more than regular earthly elements. We have metamaterials. There's a great deal of research going into metamaterials. But I remember at the time TTSA was pushing it, they kept pushing that as a buzzword. These are metamaterials, exotic materials. And to the best of my recollection or knowledge, they always were cautious and stopped short of saying these are alien crash retrieval metals. But they heavily implied it to their believer based uh, fans and in order to solicit money from those fans so that they could study these so-called alien crash retrieval materials that were not from an alien spacecraft. And we know that now normal earthly metals. We have multiple scientific studies confirming all this crap is normal earthly metals, unless they have something other than the arts park shit that they bought off of Linda Bolton Howe. And there's no proof that they do. So, Here's where I think it gets very problematic, uh, because after TTSA got a hold of it, whew, now the U.S. Army is going to waste money on these same materials. And I apologize for the dry nature of this and sharing these articles, but I had to do it this way. We're going to be sharing a video of Linda Moulton Howe next and critiquing uh, her bullshit fake men in black government cover-up explanation of the Aero report, which blows her 30-year-old hoax completely and totally to shit. How many times do we have to catch Linda Moulton Howe selling fake stories before people stop sending me hate mail? Oh, leave her alone. She's an old lady. Listen, if my grandma was scamming people on the internet, I would stand up and say something about it. And her children should be ashamed of her and her grandchildren should be ashamed. Grandmom scamming people with alien pictures again. Mom, tell grandmom to stop scamming people on the internet. She's at it again. All right. So this is the last article I'm sharing. Then we'll get to the video. U.S. Army will study metamaterials collected by UFO study group. This is where it gets great. Because now, just as David Grush and Jeremy Corbell and... And uh, Lou Elizondo and all these other wackadoos, George Knapp, Hal Putoff, Eric Davis, uh, Travis Taylor, the Skinwalker gang, just as they manipulated the United States government to waste money on UFO research, TTSA has influenced the government to waste money on these fake alien crash retrieval materials. The service has pledged to spend $750,000. I think that was raised to over a million later, uh, but don't quote me on that. I could be incorrect in my uh, terrible memory of these events. This was several years ago. To examine futuristic materials and technologies collected or studied by a group run by Blink-182's former frontman. UFO truthers don't typically hold a lot of credibility within the research community. But today, the Defense Department is acknowledging at least one such group could have some serious contributions to make. The Army Combat Capabilities Development Command recently partnered with To The Stars Academy to study a, a variety of different technologies and materials, most of which sound like they were pulled straight from a sci-fi movie. The Cooperative Research and Development Agreement is set to last five years and could ultimately help the Army develop new capabilities for its fleet of ground vehicles. Within the UFO research community, To The Stars Academy, or TTSA, carries some clout. While its chairman, former Blink-182 singer and lead guitarist Tom DeLong, garners most of the public attention, the group counts former defense and intelligence officials and industry executives among its members. 
that really should read a bunch of people who work for the government who also happen to be wackadoos. The article goes on to state, most TTSA's work has focused on publicizing the Pentagon's encounters with UFOs, uh, in which we now know the three videos that they also collected investor money with turned out to be nothing extraordinary. But under the latest agreement, the group would take on a more technical role. To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science is a company with material and technology innovations that offer cap capability advancements for Army ground vehicles. What are they? They're promising the government that they have material and technological innovations that offer capability advancements to the Army? Great. And this is while they're soliciting public investments. Where's all that technology at, Tom DeLong? Where's all that technology at, Lou Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, Hal Putoff? and everybody else who stuffed their pockets full of every UFO dollar they could during this, right? Specifically, the Army wants to explore a handful of futuristic materials and technologies the group has either studied or has in its possession, including inertial mass reduction. Again, we have metal that will float if you shoot it with terahertz. This is all the same hoax. Quantum communication, Beamed energy propulsion, active camouflage, and directed photon projection. The Army also plans to study the mechanical and electromagnetic sensitive metamaterials. There goes that buzzword again. A type of synthetic material that can manipulate light and other waves. The group collected as part of its, quote, field operations. In the short term, Army researchers are particularly in uh, interested in study how those metamaterials could improve camouflage, concealment, deception, and obfuscation capabilities of their ground vehicles. Doug Halex, a spokesperson for Combat Capabilities Development Command, told NextGov, by manipulating the light waves with a particular object, it's possible for metamaterials to render it virtually invisible. Great. The article goes on to state, both the Army and the TTSA recognize many of these technologies are purely theoretical. But some are already fall along in the development process, according to TTSA Chief Operating Officer Carrie DeLong. Yeah, uh, that's Tom DeLong's sister. In an email, she said the group's active camouflage technologies are a very mature capability. Great. They have invisibility technology. TTSA does. That's what they're telling the Army to get this contract, right? And it all comes from these alien crash retrieval materials that they bought for just $35,000. Right. So they entered into something called a CRADA, which is an agreement between the Army and a private company. In the CRADA document, Army officials valued the TTSA partnership as around, at around $1 million. Though at this point, they have no plans to enter a formal contract with the group. So... $750,000 the United States Army is pledging to study these so-called metamaterials that we now know due to the Pentagon's Aero report and this earlier 1996 scientific report. All of these materials are normal earthly materials, nothing spectacular. The first scientist who did the analysis even was able to recreate these materials on his own. But Linda Moton Howe didn't like that. Uh, great. TTSA may purport the metamaterials and other tech in their position come from UFOs, but for the Army, those claims are irrelevant. As to the origin of the materials, really to our researchers, isn't what matters, uh, Haley Uck said. The reason TTSA was taken seriously is the credentials of the people on their team. Yeah, the Army did a piss poor job. They didn't know that Eric Davis was called a crackpot researcher by the Air Force before they decided to spend three quarters of a million dollars. They're serious professionals with respect uh, to backgrounds. There's a fake Pentagon UFO program director on their board who's lying to investors. They're all lying to investors about the fake UFO program director in order to solicit money. And the Army is here saying they're serious professionals with respect to backgrounds. They needed a, they needed a wackadoo translator. That's really what they needed. And they weren't able to get it, I, I guess. Uh, so interesting that the United States government is wasting. We're going to see if we can get an accounting. Oh, I did not see this, and I apologize. Um, I want to thank all of you kind and generous benefactors. 
for those unaware, we're a viewer-supported show, and we appreciate your support. We read every single Super Chat. Sometimes during these uh, presentations, I get lost in here, though, but we'll recognize you now. <clears throat> UFO John Doe, the kind and generous 999. Checking in. Been a minute. Keep up the good work exposing these fraudsters. Of all the UFO... Pardon me. Of all the UFO grifters, would you say Linda Moulton Howe is the worst? If not, who's number one? Keep kicking the doors down on these frauds. Well, that's hard to say. That's a hard thing to come up with, UFO John Doe. Linda Moulton Howe is, I, why don't I do the top five? Stephen Greer, Linda Moulton Howe, um, gee, Lou Elizondo, Dave Grush, um, I will just say top four. Those would be my top four. Uh, Jeremy Corbell, top five. Uh, they certainly are great at generating lots of money selling completely and totally fake stories. Um, but we do uh, thank you kindly for your kindness, your generosity, and your support of the show. And, of course, uh, we want to thank you for helping us to praise the cash. One second here. I don't know where the bumpers went. Oh, there they go. Thank you, UFO John Doe, longtime show supporter. Thanks for your support. Praise the cash, praise the cash, praise the cash. All right, we've got William Harding with a kind and generous $10 super sticker. Thank you for helping us to. Praise the cash, praise the cash, praise the cash. Thank you, William Harding, longtime show supporter. And uh, we've got, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Zero, zero, go van, zero, zero with a kind and generous $5 uh, who simply says the fly. Well, we thank you for your kindness, generosity, and support. I don't know what you mean. Simon Fly? Yes. Praise the cash. Praise the cash, praise the cash, praise the cash. All right. And we've got Rotary Motion uh, who simply says, praise the cash, praise the cash, praise the cash with a kind and generous two pound super chat. You're right. And we want to take a moment also to remind you we read every single PayPal pledge. Instructions in the description of the video or podcast or how to help. We're a viewer-supported show. And we want to th take a moment, uh, besides you super chatters and super sticker people and PayPal pledgers, which we'll get to, we want to thank all of you kind and generous Patreon supporters and uh, YouTube channel members. Remember, also, if you become a YouTube channel member during a live broadcast, we give you a shout-out and thank you as well. Thanks to all of you for helping us to praise the cash. All right, now we're going to get to this video, which I've also included in the description of the video. You can just search Linda Moulton Howe on, uh, on the YouTube or uh, on YouTube, and you will find her latest video. That's the one we're going to be sharing. Uh, but just a note, we routinely, we mirror whatever video we're sharing to our own YouTube channel as private just so we could turn the monetization off because sometimes when we do these uh, commentary bits, you know, an ad will be playing from the person's video that we are sharing and critiquing. We want to avoid that. And this of course is a transformative work. We are educating the public. I'm going to put our fair use banner up. Uh, and we're going to get into Linda Moulton Howe's claims of a cover-up about these fake, completely and totally fake materials. But quickly, before we do that, I, I just want to do a recap. Um, so the claims that were made by all the people selling these parts so far, even to people selling their capabilities to the United States Army to the tune of $750,000 or a contract worth a mil more than a million, according to the United States Army spokesperson, at the time, um, they fall apart. All of the all of the claims fall apart. There's no science behind any of these claims, but that's no surprise. We're in the land of wackadoos. Um, and also, just to note, there has been a lot of false talking points, which I, you know I'm getting so tired of idiots on Twitter with their fake 
talking points. And they all parrot these fake talking points from the UFO grifting scumbag, UFO profiteering whore assholes who are selling these fake stories, right? They just they just repeat whatever they say. They don't check it if it's true. Um, so uh, claims have been made like, from Linda Moulton Howe, that there was no such thing as bismuth magnesium layering in 1947. But here's the problem. There's no proof that these materials were recovered in 1947. There's no proof that the materials actually date to 1947. They first appeared in the mid-1990s when, yes, materials of layered bismuth and magnesium were available and known by known processes, including manufacturing. So those claims fall apart. Also, there is absolutely zero evidence or proof that these, that these materials came from Roswell, either the famous event or from any other crash uh, of uh, any aircraft in Roswell, New Mexico. So those claims fall apart. There is no proof that the person who anonymously sent the materials is actually telling the truth. It's an anonymous source. All of this begins with an anonymous source. And essentially, I believe a hoaxer who sent these to Art Bell, maybe to get a laugh or to see if Art Bell would talk about him on the show. Imagine that person now with the stunning revelation that people have grifted tens of thousands, if not millions of dollars off of these fake materials since they were originally sent to Art Bell in the 1990s. There is no proof that the mysterious anonymous sender who sent the materials, who sent the medal's father was actually in the military, as was claimed in the original letter sent to Art Bell with these materials. There is no proof that person's father was ever in the military or was stationed anywhere near Roswell in 1947. You know, the problem with some of these stories is that nobody fact checks. They just go, okay, an anonymous source said. No, you, you have to know the name of the person and you have to check into their military claims and credentials and background, find out if they were stationed at their at that place at that time. But these people are not real journalists. They don't do real investigative work. They're lazy scumbags who sell fake stories to stupid people so they don't fact check because if they did, that, that might ruin a good fake story they could sell. Um, so we'll put our fair use banner up and we are going to we are going to go into this video with Linda Moulton Howe. Um, let me just make sure. Was there something? I thought there was maybe something else that I missed, but I apologize. No, I think I, I think we're good. All right, we're going to. All right, so this is fair use. It's a transformative work. We're educating the public uh, about Linda Moulton Howe's claims of being in possession of UFO or alien crash retrieval material. Uh, let's get into it, friends. We'll see. Her cat. One of them. I think she's got a couple of them. Expensive cats. Must be nice. Oh, 43 seconds. I'm sorry. Why has she got such a long... Everyone here... Oh, let's go back. You gotta give her some credit, though. She's the Grandma Grifter. Grandma's grifting again. Grandma's grifting again, Mom. Get her off the internet. Turn off the router. Grandma's grifting again. Hi, everyone here and around the world. Thanks so much for your great support the past four weeks as this Earth Files YouTube channel has broken through 263,000 subscribers. The whole time, <laughs> even now this week, I have also <laughs> been fighting a persistent flu bug that has brought me fevers, ear aches, lots of coughing, and losing my voice, which may happen tonight. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, she's an old lady. I get sick a lot. But imagine that. This woman peddling completely and totally fake stories. This tells you everything you need to know about this whole genre. If you peddle completely and totally fake stories, you too can get 250,000 subscribers of stupid people. If you actually investigate things and require evidence of claims being made, you're going to be much, much smaller. 
The truth, the truth is boring. People don't like the truth. There's some metal scraps with bismuth and magnesium in them. This isn't aliens, right? That's what a, a, a reputable or ethical journalist would tell you after careful research into these claims. But her running around, it's, it must be metal from aliens. It's going to do better, right? She's getting hundreds of thousands of views with this shit. It makes me sad. Tonight but I'm going to try. And that's why there were Earth Files rebroadcasts. But at least tonight, I have the ability to talk until I can't. I did make the Sedona Ascension Conference in Arizona, where there were many discussions about the Pentagon's all-domain anomaly resolution office, also known as ARO. Allegedly, Arrow was set up to investigate UFO UAPs, but instead it keeps pushing a debunking line that there's nothing unusual, just terrestrial, or quote, a few days ago, human made. Close. It is human made. And the burden of proof, Linda, is on the person making the claims. Linda Moulton Howe has been making these claims for 28 years. She's had 28 years to get a peer-reviewed paper about her so-called alien metals. She's never done that. She's had 28 years to produce valid scientific investigation into her claims that these uh, metal fragments of trash, I think they're trash. Somebody sent trash to Art Bell. They turned trash into tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of monetized views and then they convinced the United States government to waste $750,000 on this metal trash. So now she's going to cry and complain that Arrow did an actual scientific investigation and found that these were human made, right? Oh, no, it's a cover up. What happened when we caught her selling the fake picture of the alien on the moon? Oh, no, it's not a fake picture. Even though it's right on the cover of an Area 51 video game, just search Area 51 Xbox 360. You'll see the picture of the alien that she was selling everybody as a real picture of an alien. Oh, no, it's a men in black. It's a government cover up. Then we caught her with those orange alien fake photos that were made by a Brazilian 3D artist and writer who was writing a fictional blog series. Oh, no. The, the men in black must have paid him off to muddy the waters. It's a psyop. The men in black. It's a cover up. So, of course, now, when the startling proof that these so-called alien metals were nothing extraordinary and were, in fact, man-made, as she just said, now it's a government cover-up. It's definitely a cover-up. Let's quote. Arrow has even attacked military sources such as David Grush, who did not deserve to be attacked. Another recent... And this will show you the cult-like mentality of UFO true believers. Arrow did not attack anybody. They said there was no evidence of extraterrestrial visitation on Earth, no evidence of alien crash retrievals, no evidence of alien metals, as was claimed. That's not an attack on David Grush. That's stating facts. So this is the problem you get into with the UFO true believers. When you state facts to them, or when you cite verifiable scientific evidence and proof, you are attacking them. Example is this reddit.com headline a few days ago around March 14th, quote, recovered material and bismuth magnesium. Experimentation on alleged extraterrestrial spacecraft sample, like the piece that Tom DeLong of To The Stars purchased from Linda Moulton Howe and turned over to the US Army in 2018. Arrow has concluded that a sample from an alleged crashed off-world spacecraft that Arrow acquired from the Arrow uh, from the uh, Tom DeLong to the stars. So there's a confirmation from Linda Bolton Hale that it is indeed arts parts that TTSA was pushing as exotic materials, and that the Army became involved. That the Arrow. Uh, concluded about that metal, that it is a manufactured terrestrial alloy and does not represent off-world technology or possess any exceptional qualities that the metal 
that went to from Linda to the stars to the army is, quote, human made, close quote. Yeah. Now, a reasonable, rational person would accept the explanation of experts, but not a UFO grifter, right? The sample is primarily composed of magnesium, zinc, and bismuth, and some other trace elements such as lead. This assessment is based on its materials characterization, close quote. Well, back in April 1996, when I was doing investigative radio reports for Coast to Coast AM and Dreamland with Art Bell. Yeah, investigative reports about like, you know, Bigfoot and dogmen and poltergeists and demons, right? Real, 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 really credible work. We received odd metal pieces from a U.S. Army sergeant whom I got to talk with once briefly on the phone when he called en route to the Middle East. There's no proof that it's a U.S. sergeant. She's never released his name, his credentials. She's never showed verified proof of his military claims at all. And remember, this is a secondhand story from an anonymous source. Uncertain if he would return. In addition to the metal pieces, the army sergeant mailed his grandfather's diary pages about pulling the layered metal pieces off of the bottom of a wedge-shaped craft. Yeah, I'm sorry. I may have said that the original anonymous uh, person who sent these materials to Art Bell uh, claimed his father did it. Uh, apparently, he claimed his grandfather was the person that got the materials in 1947. So I apologize. Close quote. In New Mexico, in the late 1940s, without giving a specific date or specific site. He Later people, no. See, this is where she gets it wrong. Oh, he didn't give a specific date or site. Later, she says it was Roswell in 1947. Early, she says it was White Sands in the 1940s. So they can't even get where the materials came from straight. Here is the first letter postmarked South Carolina and signed a friend dated April 10th. In other words, an anonymous source. Uh, and I'm just going to read a portion of this and we're going to skip ahead because this, this, this lady can rattle on with her fake materials for so long. Um, the metallic samples are pure extract aluminum. You will note that they appear old and, and, and tempered and that they have been placed in tissue paper and in baggies for proster pros prosperity. Great. Uh, I would le well, like to briefly tell you what my own grandfather told me about Roswell. So uh, he said with that, she just said without a specific location in his first letter to them, he says it was from Roswell, right? And here we have uh, pictures of the material. With a water solvent wash and soon the occupant was dispatched for medical assistance and isolation. The bodies were sent to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for dispersal. The debris... Again, claims of alien bodies with no proof. He was also loaded onto three trucks, which finished the onload just before the sunset. Granddad was part of the team that went with the surviving occupant who communicated via telepathic means. <laughs> so not only did they get these crash material materials, but they got some dead alien bodies and, hey, a live alien, right? The disc was a probe ship dispatched from a launch ship that was stationed at the dimensional gateway to the Terran Earth solar system. The occupants were part of a race of explorers from the solar system 32 light years from Terra <coughs> Earth. They had been <coughs> conducting operations on Terra for over 100 years. All of this is bullshit. <clears throat> Unverifiable claims. Evidence-free claims sent <clears throat> to Linda Moulton Howe by a completely anonymous source. Nothing says credibility like accepting that there's a, a dimensional gateway to the Terran solar system, that there's probe ships and launch ships, and that the aliens are from 32 light years from Earth and that they've been conducting operations for 100 years. I love the nonchalance in which many of these people, including Linda, just state things as facts because an anonymous source said them. The dimensional power plant was self-destructed and the inner atmospheric propulsion system also deactivated 
to prevent the technology from falling into the hands of the Earth humans. Grandad spent a total of 26 weeks in the team that examined and debriefed the one survivor of the Roswell crash. Grandad now we're talking to the aliens. The project ended when the occupant was to be transported to a long-term facility. He was placed on board a U.S. Air Force transport aircraft that was to be sent to Washington, D.C. But So what we see is that the, the, the alien crash retrieval materials are just a prop in a larger, grandiose story of completely and totally unproven, unfalsifiable, un unfalsifiable claims of, you know, alien fairy tales. That's what we get. The aircraft and all aboard disappeared under mysterious and disturbing circumstances en route to Washington, D.C. It may interest you that three fighter aircraft dispatched to investigate a distress call from the transport experience many electrical malfunctioning systems, failures, as they entered the airspace of the transport's last reported location. No crash or debris of the transport was ever found. The team was disbanded. Oh, they, they well, I team. realize I have likely shocked you with this bizarre and incredible account. Millions, apparently. And seeking to remain unknown likely doesn't do anything for my credibility. Just and the metal samples only will likely add to the controversy. I am passing through South Carolina with an operational readiness mobility exercise and will mail this just prior to the exercise, possibly from the Charleston area. I will listen to your broadcast to receive any acknowledging or confirmation that you have received this package. This yeah, and isn't it interesting how so many of these UFO grifter scam squad people use anonymous military sources? There's a reason they do that, because it bolsters the story. Like, well, this is just some crackpot sending shit to our bell. You know, this is a military insider and whose granddad worked in the projects. There's absolutely no evidence for this. There's no supportive evidence to support any of this. This is a UFO wackadoo fairy tale, all provided by a completely anonymous source. And I hate to say this, but I've speculated before. For all we know, Linda Moulton Howe sent this shit and with this fake story in. There's nothing I can't prove that, but I can't I can't disprove that either. Nobody knows who the source that sent this original shit, metal shit, into Linda Moulton Howe and Art Bell actually is. She won't release any. Oh, he's anonymous. We have to protect our sources and journalistic integrity. She has no journalistic integrity. If she did, she wouldn't be selling fake pictures of aliens on the internet for cash. This letter and the contents of this package are given to you with the hope that it helps contribute to discussion on the subject of UFO phenomena. Oh, man. I agree with Neil. Ar we have to keep going because later in the presentation, she shows pictures from the alien autopsy video that has been completely and totally proven as a hoax to support her bullshit story. So she's using one fake, another fake story to bolster her fake story. Armstrong, I love it. A good friend of mine who dared to say at the White House, no less, that there are things out there which boggle the mind and are far beyond our ability to comprehend. Sign me a friend, close quote. After my first research efforts, I photographed this alleged micron layered extraterrestrial metal that. Remember, she's saying it's extraterrestrial metal. She's putting, you know, it's like, here's the facts and evidence. I took a picture of this extraterrestrial metal before I proved it was actually extraterrestrial metal. But I'm just going to say this is extraterrestrial metal. You see the problem with this? It's like the cart before the horse. She took a picture of the extraterrestrial metal. The grandfather, according to the army guy, he the grandfather pulled some of the pieces off the bottom of the wedge-shaped craft in the late 1940s. 
I worked with a University of Michigan scientist who requested anonymity, but provided weeks of research, images, and analysis. Further, a Carnegie Institute scientist used an ion microprobe to analyze the micron-layered silver and black metal made of 26 alternating layers of one to four microns black bismuth and 100 to 200 microns of silver magnesium zinc alloy that was 96.4% magnesium with 11% more magnesium 26 in it than normal earth magnesium. 11% more magnesium in it than normal earth magnesium. That doesn't make any sense. And this is why, you know, this woman's not a scientist. I don't understand her making science claims, right? With no science degree, but each of it is. six pieces <clears throat> received from U.S. Army source were formed with a curvature that tapered. Over the past 28 years, since April of 1996, I have contacted several different scientists and laboratories for tests and analysis of what the metal is made of and what its function might have been. Yeah, did you hear she's contacted several people, right? Uh, because the first scientist who looked at these metals said, normal earthly metals, nothing extraordinary. Uh, this is reproducible material. A bit odd, but there, this is normal earthly material. She didn't like that guy's analysis. She fired him buried his his report on it and then kept going until she could find guys that would say there was something strange about her alien metals alleged alien metals on a wedge-shaped craft of unknown origin that allegedly crashed between san mateo mountains below socorro and west of roswell at sierra blanca on or near White Sands Proving Ground, about 90 miles west of Roswell, New Mexico. All right, so we're back to a different location, White Sands. Remember, back and forth. Oh, it crashed, this object crashed in Roswell in 1947. Oh, we didn't get an exact date. It was the late 1940s when it crashed. She can't even get her basic facts straight. Where did the object crash? What year did it crash? When was, when was these materials recovered? She can't even get the basic facts straight. The, the specific crash retrieval date is uncertain, but must have been after September 18th, 1947, when the U.S. Air Force was separated from the U.S. Army. The Army source references the U.S. Air Force, which didn't exist before September 18th, 1947. One military source told me the date was actually in 1949 not 1947, but that... So is she saying that the guy who sent the materials can't get his story straight? I think she just did. As a crash date for this is not confirmed. The oh, it might've been 1949. Another of my fake military sources told me that the first military source was wrong. It wasn't 1947, it was 1949 that this crashed. Even the... It doesn't make any sense. These various shaped silver pieces were in the first April 10th, 1996 shipment from the U.S. Army source. I contacted Alcoa Aluminum to see if they would test some of the pieces. They agreed, and an Alcoa manager called me and asked, where did you get these? They are 99% pure aluminum, and we don't process at that purity level. No, but some manufacturers do process at that purity level. One thing uh, that I know from computer science is that some of the copper in in modern computers is a level of is sometimes some manufacturers go to a level of purity higher than most people do. And that's done so that it conducts electricity better. There are reasons for different manufacturing processes. And for her to just take the word of one person, well, one company doesn't make it this pure, so it must be aliens. You know, this is the circle jerk, stupid, fake pseudoscience arguments of a, of a wackadoo here. Close quote. In a second letter from the Army Sergeant postmarked April 22nd, 1996 from South Carolina, he wrote, quote, what is to... So this anonymous source loves writing long letters to Art Bell and telling alien stories, apparently, because he kept sending letters. Day fiber optic technology was part and parcel of the alien technology within the control panels that became fused and melted 
when the self-destruct mechanism was activated. There were Westinghouse affiliated persons on the team and granddad always thought that some of them had gone back with the knowledge and incorporated it into the future research with the phone systems. Of course, the military was concerned as to the ability of the aliens to enter our atmosphere at will, undetected, and thus they recommended to the president that a space program be set into motion. We got the president involved in these fake alien space medals. And that a system of satellites be placed into orbit by 1957. And this satellite system be patched into the... It really is like the Linda Moulton House story time hour. Right? And do long... So come on, sit down, kids. It's time to hear a fairy tale. Line ...early warning system, which became later NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command. I agree, Charlie, 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 you're correct. Granddad crack. stated that it was his opinion that NORAD was formed not only to track possible ICBMs from hostile nations, but as an established detection <laughs> system for UFO craft. That is why the NASA Space Agency has been incorporated by and large with our armed forces and there are so many classified missions. <laughs> this is my agree, opinion. Amy the granddad prophesied such occurring as far back as 1971, <laughs> implying the <laughs> militarization of space. Well, I am scheduled to I travel so, back Matt, to Charleston Air Force Base and then Pope <laughs> Air Force Base in North Carolina with JSOC, the Joint Air Special Force. Operations Command. I'll mail this from somewhere in South Carolina. <laughs> I probably won't communicate again. She killed those My cows. wife is I'm concerned, sure as am I, that the intelligence agencies will put two and two together. So it is yeah, inadvisable good, to further communicate this. These letters were sent from somebody with a typewriter. You know who was big on a typewriter? Richard Doty, right? Part of me always thought that Richard Doty was behind this scam. Richard Doty, uh, proven Air Force Office of Special Investigations paid disinformation officer, uh, disinformation agent. He loved to, to mess with UFO people like Linda Moulton Howe and others. He told me some stories like he would he would send Linda Moulton Howe the, the, the stupidest fake stories that he could and she would run with them. So, you know, this anonymous sender, whoever sent these medals, could literally be anybody. Information. I hope you understand my position. I could likely face a court's martial or sedition charges for stating some of this information. And there is the prover. You got to pretend that this information is so dangerous that sharing it could get you in trouble, right? That's why I have to remain anonymous. No. You have to remain anonymous so that the assholes selling this fake story never have to submit you to fact checking because you likely don't exist. Uh, you know, and by the way, I'm all for an anonymous source being used in good investigative journalism. Like if you need a second source, but one doesn't want their name mentioned. But these these stories that we get in UFO land, if you notice something, they're mostly always single source stories that cannot be fact checked. Right. And one of the other things they love doing is citing dead people as sources because you can't fact check a dead man. You also can't fact check an anonymous source. This is an awful lot of information and we can't fact check any of the information in these letters at all. And opinions. Further information regarding the Roswell crash and my own grandfather's affiliation would likely be potentially beneficial in your efforts at correlation and verification. In this regard, I can only say, based on past conversations definitely. on Spend the money. subject with Granddad, we, we definitely would like that. that the retrieval the team consisted of three segments, the on-site team, the in-house yep. team My life is in and the security team. Spend money. The credentials of the team <laughs> My members life is in danger. weren't only military related. Is important. Send there money. were individuals with backgrounds from the University of Colorado, the Office of Naval Research, the Army Air Force, the U.S. Air Force, and U.S. Army, the University of California. So look, listen to all these claims. Like it's such a big and grandiose story, right? 
a sandwich. And there's so many details. Like if your grandpa like pulled some shit off of a off of something that crashed that he thought was aliens and he gave you that, would he give you all of these specific details? down to like what government agencies were involved. And it's just, it's, it's a bridge too far for me, especially from a single anonymous source that cannot be fact checked on any of this shit. Phyllis and the Atomic Energy Commission and National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics and Office of Scientific Research and Development. Additionally, there were consultants from England, France, and Russia <laughs> You're right, involved. Lucy Day. Thanks for being a member. There were control type devices well, thanks, John forged Adventure. in the shape of the alien hand, which were assumed as controls and activation surfaces, close quote. Yeah. So she's using a, a fake anonymous source who says there were controls that the hands were placed into uh, at the crash site. And this is from Ray Santilli, the, the completely and totally 100% provably fake alien autopsy video. All of this shit that she's showing on the screen is fake while she's reading you a letter from a single source anonymous source that nobody's allowed to fact check, that nobody did any actual vetting or fact checking of, that nobody else is allowed to interview or fact check, right? So we've got one fake story backing up another fake story. This is what counts as evidence to some of these people. It's so weak. This it's U.S. Childish. Army man also holds, quote, UFO panels with depressions of six-fingered handprints allegedly found with two six-fingered humanoids in May 31st to June 2nd, 1947 at a UFO recovery operation at a crash site southwest of Socorro, <laughs> New Mexico. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh Lou Horton said, she said the writer of these letters is from South Carolina. Century Aluminum Company is in Mount Holly, South Carolina. That's interesting. So maybe it's somebody that works at a metal company that sent these. Close quote. The black and white photograph is from 16 millimeter film leaked in 1995 to Ray Santilli, owner, Orbital Media Limited in London, England. But the photo wasn't leaked. At the end they faked of the it. Army sergeants. She just said that that photo was leaked to Ray Santilli. They faked that photo. They faked the whole alien autopsy thing, and she's using it for evidence, friends. Second letter, postmarked South Carolina, April 22nd, 1996. Quote, you would be surprised at the extent of internal policies on this subject and the consequences for current commissioned officers Again, with the consequences. Oh, I'm taking such a huge risk sending you this important, vital information. Talking about UFO phenomena. Now, that's how they impress a sense of importance to the story that they're sharing. This information is so important and it's so classified and it's so secret that I could be killed for sending it to you or whatever shit. They all do this. All the grifters do this. We have to invent a term for that. I was surprised by Edgar Mitchell's statements of recent date, and I imagine there are many involved with Roswell who are a bit upset at events underway. However, Dr. Mitchell is a man quote. of outstanding really character and integrity Close and quote. knows Open whereof quote. he speaks, as do quite a few other astronauts. And he closed yeah, with, quote, they don't want to be killed like those cows. I wish you, Art and Linda, all the best and will be listening. I commend your courage and integrity. I hope your listeners understand <laughs> that the subject of Roswell has great potential at extrapolating the truth on UFOs and what has come to be known as a cosmic Watergate is only the tip of an iceberg. Granddad said that when the truth does come out, humanity will be changed beyond comprehension. Note the use of the term cosmic Watergate. Do you know where that term comes from? It comes from Stanton Friedman. So whoever wrote these letters was extremely familiar with existing UFO mythology. That's a red flag for me. If it was just some guy in the army and his grandpa told him a story and showed him a box of metal samples, he wouldn't know the term cosmic Watergate unless he was following 
Stanton Friedman and all of his lectures. So whoever wrote these letters is obviously somebody very familiar with terminology common in the UFO community. And that's a huge red flag. That means it's not just some army guy. It's somebody in ufology. It's somebody in this thing that sent these letters. And by the way, they borrowed, you know, uh, stories from basically stories from Philip Corso, stories of the Roswell crash and alien bodies and all of this and technology transfer and fiber optics. This is all all the information in these letters. There's nothing new except hey, some metal samples. All of the stories that this person is telling is from existing UFO stories and mythology, which, by the way, all of those stories have equally no proof. So we've got a guy repeating stories that had no proof the first time they were told and incorporating them into this story. But by the way, I do have some evidence. Here's some metal samples from the crash site. I mean, it's a good, it's a good grift. kind of. You got to give it. It's a good grift. But there's so many red flags that say. Whoever wrote these letters is a member of, of the UFO community. He also said many on the in-house team lobbied to release the information to the public. Not all of them were paranoid in trusting the public with the truth. Sign me, still a friend, close quote. And yesterday, March 19th, 2024, the first day of spring, came honest words from a retired physicist who knows a lot about the New Mexico late 1940s UFO metal skin made of very thin one to four micron size, pure black bismuth layers alternating with larger 100 to 200 micron thick magnesium zinc layers. Plus, and by the way, all of the jargon about the micron layers that she's reading off, she's never proven by scientific measure. In other words, trust me, bro, it's this many microns and whatever. This is a completely evidence-free story. Other nearly pure aluminum. Now she's talking about talking to a nuclear physicist. So is she really gonna attack another anonymous source onto an entire story that's already based on an anonymous source? I think so. She didn't name the scientist, but now he's going to say things like these metals have to be aliens or something, and she's not going to tell us who the physicist who said this is. Tonight, I am sharing the physicist's own recently written comments to me about the Pentagon Arrow Office's dishonest what physicist quote human made claim about the bismuth magnesium zinc layered metals and the nearly pure aluminum metals that I've investigated since April 1996, 28 years ago. And here is the first page of two pages. Notice, where what is his name? What is the name of the physicist? So this whole story starts in the 1990s based on a completely, totally evidence-free anonymous source. Now, She's tacking another anonymous source as a prover maneuver on top of the original evidence-free anonymous source. Great. Great. Sent to me from the physicist. Quote. Linda, in order to prepare for a complete and accurate response, I would need to review the results of all testing of the materials recently by the various labs that confirm the exact nature of the original materials that have been tested. These test results should provide the evidence required to counter the human made claims of Pentagon arrow Sean Kirkpatrick. That is a direct quote from the physicist letter. From the anonymous physicist. Continuing yes. quote. Not only is the material purity and structure inconsistent with similar materials found on earth, but the manner in which the layers were created were well beyond the capabilities of human produced layer right, deposition right. in the time frame in which those materials were stated to have been collected and stored. Decades ago. I this physicist may be Travis Taylor, by the way. I'm just putting that out there. 
I had personally examined similar materials that were stored in secure vaults. The materials that I had examined and performed testing upon. Or it could be Eric Davis. It's one of the UFO wackadoo science guys. At that time, were in both damaged and undamaged condition. So I had gathered a lot of experience working with these materials during my career. They can be very dangerous to test to those unfamiliar with how, Again, with the danger. how they can respond to applied energy. They can also be damaged by an incorrect application of energy that is foreign to their operation. This is how those materials ended up in our hands, so to speak. As I had mentioned prior, in 2014 to 2017. Yeah, this is Eric Davis then. Eric Davis is a physicist and he examined these in that time frame. So again, all, re all roads lead back to the same wackadoos. The same wackadoos that are behind David Grush, the same wackadoos that are behind the Skinwalker Ranch. Why doesn't she name him? It's clear now that that physicist has to be Eric Davis since he examined them in the vaults of the TTSA and the Atom Project, right? Why doesn't she just name Eric Davis? Is it because people know now if it comes from Eric Davis that it's bullshit, so she's going to hide his name? I believe when I had examined those material samples long before, Apparent atmospheric friction heating had caused a lot of damage to the outer facing surface layers of those samples. The damage lessened as the layers progressed inward. That damage would have greatly impacted the operating <laughs> You're efficiency right, of the material. No, he claims that he did examine them. The physics involved is highly advanced now commonly referred to as quantum physics. Yeah, I got to throw in quantum physics. In my physics. era, we had to fabricate to fabricate a null G, which is null gravity room, in order to even begin a fabrication process. The presence of gravity caused distortions in crystalline formations. As we progressed in stages, we had to rebuild the null G room multiple times with newer generation materials in order to finally reach yeah, a high enough this is state of crystalline shit from perfection another anonymous in the source. end product. But likely maybe Without this, they the materials produced would be greatly flawed, as we discovered had occurred prior to my involvement in the program. Yeah, and, and remember, I included the part earlier in the broadcast about Eric Davis, just so you could see what a wackadoo he is. Apparently, that may be her source. Uh, he... he or it's uh, some physicists that examined these metals while they were in the possession of TTSA and the Atom Project, right? This was done to prevent eventual fatal neural tissue damage to occupants exposed to flawed <laughs> null. This shit could kill you. It's so dangerous. It's secret. G fields. With the newer generation materials, we were also able to greatly increase drive efficiency which greatly reduced operational energy no, I don't think it's Travis because she said he's a physicist. Eric Davis is a physicist. Close quote. Next week, I would like to share with you some of the original ion microprobes, the original work that I did with... Here comes the pseudoscience jargon to sell this fake story. The uh, scanning the original work that I did in a major university, there's a lot. And all of it goes against the Aero Office's dismissal that all of this was human made. Yeah, so what we've got so far is a completely anonymous source making claims, Linda Moulton Howe making claims, TTSA making claims, the members of TTSA making claims while soliciting millions of dollars in investment capital from stupid UFO fans. And now we've got a physicist who claims he examined the materials and they can't have been made on Earth. And then we've got an on-the-record materials science specialist who said they're normal earthly materials. That was back in the 1990s. And then we've got Arrow, who got these materials from the United States Army and TTSA and tested them and said, normal earthly metals. These are man-made, manufactured metals. 
But Linda Monell is going to still try to claim that her anonymous person who sent her these who nobody fact checked, nobody vetted, nobody can talk to, nobody even knows if he exists, who sent these medals, and a physicist that's also got to remain anonymous for whatever reason said, no, no, uh, they're they're from you know the planet Z you know, Xanadu or something. No, you have to provide science and real scientific inquiry require transparency. You can't say. I can't tell you where I got the medals and I can't tell you if the guy who gave me the medals is who he says he is, or if his grandfather who got the medals originally, since this is a secondhand story is who he says he is, but I got a scientist who said they must be alien, but I can't, I can't tell you who he is. This is not science. Science requires transparency. This is garbage peddling. Absurd. And now Ian, having this, first presentation sort of laying out what the source of the materials originally came with, with these uh, valuable letters from the U.S. Army sergeant who was the... Uh, Remember, she keeps saying U.S. Army sergeant. She hasn't proved that that person who sent the letters was ever in the Army. Son of the grandfather, grandson of the grandfather. Uh, grandson of the grandfather, okay. I also look forward to being able to show in great detail the science work that we did and why it was very interesting to other people in 2018 who wanted to now apply more testing and application of the layered bismuth and magnesium materials. She meant to say it was a good grift and in 2018 somebody bought the grift off of me to grift it further. And sure, Linda Moulton Hale perhaps made tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars selling this story originally. That's up to her to answer for. I don't know the exact number of money she made, but she made a VHS tape about this. She did paid lectures, monetized podcasts and YouTube and, you know, virtual conferences talking about this material. She's selling a, a tape just about this material. But TTSA took it further and actually got the United States government to waste $750,000 on what has been described as normal earthly materials or man-made manufactured materials. In technology. And as we speak right now on March 20th of 2024, it is my understanding that still the application of the bismuth magnesium zinc layered material that involves the placement atom by atom. They've never proven that these things were manufactured atom by atom. That's another pseudoscientist claim that nobody has, has proven or established any evidence to support that statement. Of iridium in the pure aluminum one of the keys we still cannot do. We still cannot do. Well, then why did scientists that look at it say that we could? You know, there's always a problem with these people. And on one side, we've got real scientists and, you know, on the record statements to back up what they are saying, which is these are normal earthly materials. And on the other side, We've got a wackadoo in the form of Linda Moulton Hale who's been caught selling provably fake stories over and over and over and over again using two completely and totally anonymous sources so far to claim, no, no, the government lied. They're definitely from aliens. So I look forward to sharing more. But right now, Ian, I'm wondering if we have some questions. All right. Uh, the, the next part, she takes questions from her wackadoo followers and it's really not too interesting because they're, her whole audience is full of stupid people. You have to be stupid to sit through this grifting, you know, despicable, delusional woman who is selling people complete and total fairy tales for money. Uh, but we made it through. Uh, and I think I've got a little more to share with you. And that is. I want to talk for a moment about the TTSA end of this. After all, 
All these claims that are being made were being made while they were soliciting public investor money. And now we know that we can add more lies to the list of lies and half truths and, you know, distortions and carefully crafted narratives that TTSA in the form of Tom DeLong, Christopher Mellon, uh, Justice, uh, Gary Nolan, Lou Elizondo, Tom DeLong, and others were all profiting from these false narratives that were being pushed largely with no evidence. Trust me, bro, this metal came from aliens. Well, when real material scientists look at this, uh, these materials, they come back and say, there's nothing extraordinary about these. These are normal earthly metals. So, you know, this this TTSA thing where they're collecting millions of dollars making these claims or riding off the backs of the claims. And I find it interesting that maybe for legal reasons, TTSA was a little more careful. They were coming and saying, these are extraterrestrial materials. But Linda Moulton Hale had already established to the believer brain community that these are extraterrestrial materials. So they didn't have to say it. They could get away with saying things like, exotic metamaterials from a UAP crash recovery or whatever they said is very misleading. It's very deceptive. And I find it interesting that we've got, uh, you know, a fake UFO program director in the form of Lou Elizondo was involved in pushing these completely and totally ordinary earthly metals as something more than they were. It's, it's the old overpromise and under deliver that we talk about so much here. In order to sensationalize and clickbait ready these narratives, these false stories, these evidence-free stories, you need to overpromise and hype it up, right? But inevitably that leads to the big letdown and inevitably it leads to uh, the land of broken promises. TTSA was collecting money claiming these are exotic materials and they're going to do all this scientific testing and release the results. Where are the results? And who do they have actually doing any scientific inquiry into this? How put off? A complete and total wackadoo, high-ranking Scientologist. Yeah, he believes in Xanadu and the Phaetons and all that shit, right? And he, he claimed in a Scientology publication that he got superpowers from being a Scientologist, right? And he's been involved in a, a multitude of paranormal, some would say paranormal scams in which people were defrauded of money so he could do so-called psychic research. But his research was shoddy. His research was, was proven to be completely flawed. He declared that Yuri Geller had real superpowers. Uh, he was using magic tricks. Then we've got Eric Davis, the crackpot researcher. Then we've got Travis Taylor, an optical physicist on the Skinwalker Ranch television show who can't tell the difference between a fly and an uh, alien spacecraft doing 30,000 miles an hour. You know, I just, I, 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 sometimes you just have to shake your head and wonder. Like, this is the level of garbage that we get. And I'm just amazed that people digest this. And I'm fascinated with the reasons why it works. The reason why it works is because nobody stops and facts checks these people. You know, uh, to his credit, Joe Rogan was kind of like, what the fuck are you saying? When Tom DeLong was on his show claiming that if you shoot terahertz at these things, they float, they, they do mass cancellation and they float and all of these other things. Um but mostly people just accepted what all these people were saying. And, you know, a greater man than me once said, of course, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. If you're going to say, I have pieces of an alien spaceship, then get some goddamn qualified material scientists. Oh, and we also they also had Gary Nolan looking at these things, who is an immunologist you know, completely and totally unqualified to make any scientific inquiry into material science or chemistry. But hey, you know, it's just ridiculous. This is the land of wackadoos. And, uh, you know, it's the cult of wackadoos. By the way, follow me on Twitter at Stephen Cambian. I'll take some comments and questions from the live chat, but we're going to bounce on out of here soon. For those unaware, 
this is spring break week. And that means I have my children at home with me, uh, which is a lot more difficult than one might imagine because I have two boys, seven, and uh, my oldest son is turning 12 this Thursday. Can't believe it. He's almost a teenager. Um, and these guys are, you know, my older son is autistic and he requires a lot of attention and, and more care. And also he requires constant supervision. You can't like leave him alone in a room or something because strange things happen because of the sensory issues. So uh, I'm pretty beat up, you know, this early morning till, uh, you know, imagine children from 8 a.m. until 8.30 p.m. And then, oh, I have to do a show for two hour, two or three hours. So this week, uh, we're going to try to keep it light on me so that I have the time and energy for my various daddy duties and snack bitch, uh, you know, responsibilities. These kids are eating like great chips, popcorn, can I have a tasty cake? Can I have a yoo Can I have some juice? Can I have some punch, right? I, I didn't want punch, Daddy. I wanted iced tea. I've just been the snack bitch running around filling cups and getting trays of snacks for them. I call them both princes, right? Like, I make fun of them. Like, here are your snacks, Prince Xavier, you know? <laughs> I'm beat, though, and it's only been two days, I, and I'm worried about summer because I'm going to have them for the greater part of the summer every day and night and weekend, and like, <laughs> wow, it's a tall order. So comments or questions, please put them in all capital letters. Uh, trolly troll troll. If you had some hodgepodge of metals, how are you going to make an alloy according to specifications? Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. I'd love to see the numbers because here's the thing, like manufacturing processes are not perfect, but, you know, the, even just the, the the ratio of the elements may tell us something like, okay, this is a common, because it might be a common component. Okay, there's 8% magnesium in this aluminum and that's done in aircraft industry to lighten the aluminum load and make it lighter for for air travel it might be easy to identify just based on the ratios and i gotta say way back in 1995 i gave this story a chance but the deeper i got i heard her saying things that i knew were provably false or that didn't really matter like this argument that if you hit these samples with enough voltage they wiggle they move I knew from playing with Tesla coils and a Van de Graaff generator that any piece of metal is going to move if you put it in an electron field or if you you shoot enough voltage into it, it's going to move. Uh, that's just basic physics, you know. Uh, Chris Johansson says, at least they are asking most kids today are entitled brats and they bark orders to their parents. Well, yeah, no, my kids are pretty well mannered. I have to say that I taught them manners. Thank please. Thank you, sir. No, sir. You know, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. I tried to. And that seems so old school to me. Right. Like a kid calling somebody sir or ma'am. But I want them to. It's just respect. That's how I grew up. Smith says, loads of old stories have UFOs ejecting metal. Has Linda ever tied them in? Cheers, Stephen. Yeah, I'm sure she reported on that other story where it turned out to be industrial byproduct waste. And the guy was like, no, it, it dropped from a UFO. Uh, but that was another story of so-called alien materials that turned out to be completely and totally normal earthly material, right? Uh, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Aliens or sus says they test Sasquatch hair or so I've heard, but can't test UFO material. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't understand. Trolley troll. My point is, if you're going to make an alloy of, say, one element at 80 percent and another at 20 percent, it is necessary that both ingredients need to be 100 percent pure to get the right ratio. Good point. <clears throat> yes, good point. So I appreciate all of you for joining us tonight. I thought we would do this because these people are so desperate. Arrow, despite whatever anybody says, has actual evidence. You know, they actually investigated things. They didn't just take anonymous 
letter writer's word for fantastical stories. And the original scientist who did the original analysis on these, completely and totally normal earthly metals. A little weird, but I can reproduce them, and he did. So all these talks about these were atomically aligned or these were created in a zero-G environment or all of these fake talking points, these pseudoscience, evidence-free talking points fall apart. And unfortunately, what we're left with is a grift of a grift of a grift. Remember, Art Bell started the grift, and I think even he was like, wait, this shit's too grifty for me. Well, we're going to step off. And then Linda Moe and Hal picked up the grift and ran with it and did pretty good selling lots of VHS tapes about this stupid shit, this totally evidence-free fake story based on an anonymous guy and some other anonymous guys. And let's, let's fire the scientists who said they're normal earthly metals. We'll just keep hiring wackadoo scientists until somebody says, yeah, you're right, Linda Moulton Howe. This is alien metal from a spaceship. And, and then, of course, TTSA takes it and runs with it and somehow convinces the United States government to waste $750,000 on metals from an anonymous sender that nobody vetted, nobody even knows his name, nobody vetted his grandpa, nobody knows if he really worked anywhere near Roswell in 1947, nobody even knows if the, if the source of these metals even exists, or if it's just some grifter creating the fake anonymous source to sell the story, to make the money, and then TTSA somehow convinces the United States government to waste $750,000 at least, I think, on this nonsense. And by the way, I have inquired into the Army Office of Public Relations, and somebody's going to answer my questions. I have decided that I will not be ignored. And uh, I have some valid press credentials now, thanks to a friend. They know who they are. I'm calling them every day. Every day I'm on the phone. Every day I call up the Army and say, excuse me, did you know that these metals were determined to be normal, earthly, ordinary metals in 1996? But they fired that guy because they needed to sell the alien metal story? Did you know X, Y, or Z? What did you spend $750,000 on if these are normal, earthly metals? Um, and I'm going to get us some answers because... Uh, you know, good investigative journalism, it, it has to be adversarial. And by the way, I don't have anything against the United States Army. Uh, I come from a, a family with many military, you know, we've got Navy, Air Force, Marines, and uh, and Navy in my family. I love military. Thank you for your service if you served in the military. I love the military, and they, I think by and large they do a good job protecting our country and keeping us safe. But if you're going to spend $750,000 out of the taxpayer funds to study metals from some UFO wackadoo who also says that aliens come to Earth and cut off the assholes and lips of fucking cows, I want to know why. Did you know she says aliens cut off the assholes and lips of cows to, before you spent the 750 Gs on this dumb shit? Did you know that Tom DeLong says all kinds of things, too, that aren't true? You know, he believes in Bigfoot and dogmen and, and extraterrestrials and crypto terrestrials and all this shit. Did you know that the organization that you got these things from was possibly or allegedly defrauding investors by telling them completely, totally fake information like we're building a spaceship when they're soliciting money? Did you know that organization you got these medals from had a fake UFO program director on their board? <laughs> oh, it's going to be great. So maybe we'll do a part two if I actually get an on-the-record interview. And I, I'm, I'm insisting that they have to. I'm insisting they have to uh, answer some questions. Uh, the Hydrogen Line says, Stephen, as much as I loved Art Bell, I feel that he shares some responsibility for this alien metal nonsense. As the show host, he should have done some vetting before talking about it on his air. I agree with you 100%. I agree with you 100%. You know, I and by the way, I loved Art Bell too. A, a great part of the reason I'm here is because of Art Bell and all those nights listening to, you know, his show and and imagining the possibilities and, and really wanting these stories to be true and real. 
Don't abuse uh, on hard work on the wood, Stephen. Watch your body and aches. Yeah, yeah. Linamont Hale is solely responsible for plunging beef supplies, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Yeah, she killed all those cows to sell fake alien stories. Extraterrestrials, crypto terrestrials, says Operation Shutdown. Yeah, so, you know, I think that's all I got for you, and I apologize. I think I have a little bit more, but we'll save it for the eventual part two. Once we get some on the record army sources explaining why they wasted all this money on what is complete and total horseshit. Uh, and we'll bring that to you. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to bounce on out of here. I will be back tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time unless my children murder me or exhaust me to the point that I have to take a night off. Uh <laughs> They're really challenging taking care of them all day and night. It gives me much more respect for their mom who just does it without even thinking. Like she doesn't even like, <laughs> wow. Women are blessed with much more of a, I think, patient maternal spirit with young ones. And I'm like, a, you know, let's move on. What's next? Like, okay, you got your snacks. Like, don't bug me, you know? No, now I need a drink or now, you know, let's watch a movie or like, oh man. It's tough. <laughs> Anybody that has children can understand that tired level you reach. You know, you just, you know, I'm like the walking dead when I have them all day and night. Thank God for school. So they got spring break. They'll be back next week to school. But then in a few short months, uh, they'll be home with me all day indefinitely for the whole summer. So that'll be challenging. But I'm up for it. You know, you just put your super dad cape on, right? <laughs> Al Gray echoing my statement. They wasted money on complete and total horseshit. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Sandra McDonald says, back on carnivore, Stephen. It's time. Yeah, I need more energy. I'm slowly getting back on it, Sandra. I had uh, I had a little bit of rice today with a whole lot of stir fry. Uh, you know, uh, I'm definitely eating healthier, but I haven't cut the carbs and all the veggies yet. Um, I'm going to. So, uh, yeah, this story, I think, is a complete and total busted hoax. And the fact that Linda Moulton Hale, after 30 years of grifting off this story, sees the Aero report busting this stuff as completely and totally man-made material as a new opportunity to grift a few more dollars out of this old fake story tells you everything you need to know about Linda Moulton Hale. Oh, and by the way, I don't know if this is... Well, it's supposed to happen. So Linda Moulton Hale is a frequent speaker at um, Contact in the Desert. I think she's there almost every year. Um, and, you know, I became kind of curious uh, about why uh, Contact in the Desert was willing to keep booking somebody that keeps getting caught selling completely and totally fake stories. And I always wanted to ask them about it. And so now the co-owner of Contact in the Desert, Daniel Harari, has agreed to do a one-hour interview with me. I'm not really sure if he knew who I was, but he agreed to the interview. So I'm putting that on the record. Uh, Mr. Harari is the co-owner of uh, Contact in the Desert Conference. And I'm going to go through the speakers list and talk about the fake stories that every, not every of their speakers, but many of their speakers have been caught selling fake stories. And so when I have an opportunity to, to interview him and ask him questions about Contact in the Desert, I'm going to ask him about, what about this speaker that sold this fake story? What about Linda who sold those fake alien pictures? If you're really about disclosing the truth to people, why are you booking proven scammers and liars at your so-called disclosure conference? It makes no sense to me. We'll see if uh, it's booked. He booked it. So if he if he if he changes his mind, hey, I understand. Uh, but I think that it would be a helpful conversation, and I promise to be respectful and kind to him. But you know, ask him some very difficult questions that I think somebody has to answer. Uh, somebody has to ask these people. If you're all about the truth, why are there so many proven liars and scammers on your list of paid speakers at your events? It doesn't make sense to me. But it does make sense to me because UFOs and aliens is not about getting to the truth. It's about, it's definitely about entertainment. 
It's entertainment. It's it's alien story time hour. That's it. Just like this story we detail tonight, most of these stories are based on evidence-free claims or uh, shoddy witnesses or, or other less than credible sources of evidence and information. But it's sad that something like Contact in the Desert, you know, people who are really thirsting for the truth and they show up at a conference like Contact in the Desert and they get to hear from a bunch of people that have been selling fake stories for years or decades. I don't think that's helpful when you're selling a product to people who are interested in the truth, but what do I know? So, yeah, uh, I, I'm just putting it on the record. We booked him, uh, and that'll be the first or second week in April. I think it's April 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern. So he's booked. We'll, we'll see if he uh, follows through. I hope that he does, because I'd like to have this conversation about, you know, this – elephant in the room of booking complete and total scammer liars at a conference that's supposed to be about the truth, right? I don't know. Call me old fashioned, but I don't think booking proven scammers, liars, hoaxers, or whoever at a conference about disclosure and the truth is very helpful. I mean, but they may just be about putting asses in the seats and that's why they book the, you know, less than credible people. Um, uh, Anyway, I think that this story is never going to die and that some true believers, because so much, so much stories and talking points have been generated, most of them false from these false alien, uh, alleged alien crash retrieval materials, that this story is never going to go away. And even if it does, somebody 10 years from now will pull this out and sell this as a, as a new grift. All these things, you know, rinse and repeat. They come back even when they're busted and, and proven to be completely and totally fake. They'll come back later when people forget that the proof has been out there. In this case, the proof has been out there since 1996. Normal earthly metals. I can reproduce them. Nothing extraordinary, nothing alien here. The proof has been out there since 1996, and it's been largely ignored in favor of sensationalized clickbait, sensational nonsense that people can profit from. And that's sad. People don't want the truth. I've always said it. They want a good story. And if the truth is boring, they'll prefer the the good fake story. And that's a sad commentary on today's so-called truther community. So that's all I got for you, friends. I'll be back tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you'll be here with me. Until next time, friends, my name is Stephen Camby, and good night, and God bless all of you.